um, I guess I was talking to TJ and Jody, and they were like, do you want to open up? And I gave them the no because I tried it. It's just instinct by now, but I thought it would be good to go ahead and up here. Luke Ke Keekley sitting up here in the second row. I think she's cheering for the Panthers. Glad everyone that can make it out tonight on this Super Bowl night. Uh, so is there any prayer requests? Remember Brother Lee. for her. Yeah. Absolutely. Let's remember him. Absolutely. It, and, you know, for me, I'm, I'm at that age, and I know how hard it is at that college, and I've been raised in a church. And so when you see people like that that are coming out, it really moves me because these are people I go to school with, and it's hard. So I remember that. Absolutely. Pray for Brian. There's no more. So everybody raise your hand, right hand for unspoken, and ask Brother Scotty if he'll come pray for us.
Christian just volunteered and said he could also sing. But I don't know if y'all could hear that or not. If you've got a Bible, go ahead and turn with me um, to the book of Acts, chapter 3. Book of Acts, chapter 3 is our text tonight. I want to start off by asking you a question and then share a little story with you. Um, and then we'll get into the message here, but... What is it that you would define as satisfaction? The person, your spouse, your kids, set amount of money, stuff, material, I don't know. Uh, for some people, maybe it's an emotion. You feel satisfied when you're at peace with things, when you're at joy, when things are going well in life, um, when you're at peace financially. When you're at peace at home, when you're at peace at work, is, is that how you would define satisfaction? Uh, 1965, after taking an inordinate amount of drugs one evening, a young man by the name of Keith Richards, who was a major player in a, a rock and roll band called Rolling Stones, had a guitar in his hand one night and a tape recorder was playing. He tells the story that he woke up the next morning and he doesn't remember anything and the tape recorder was still going. And he hit play on it and was trying to listen to whatever it is he recorded, just completely stoned out of his mind. And out from that came a, a worldwide phenomenal number one hit. And the title of the song was, I Can't Get No Satisfaction. And in that song, he basically references that there's nothing in this world that satisfied him materialistically, emotionally, even as far as going to say sexually, and all these other areas of his life that he couldn't find satisfaction. And in other words, I'm just going to live it up as best I can because there's nothing here that will satisfy who I am. Um, I think if we're not careful, we can really wrongly define satisfaction. Um, I want to read in the book of Acts tonight where I think real satisfaction comes from, starting in verse 1 and 2, and then we'll pray and get into the message. The Bible says, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple, at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour, verse 2, And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Let's pray about that. God, thank you for the opportunity to come in here tonight. We could be in a lot of different places. Um, and we're not bragging that we're here, God, but we're just saying thank you for allowing us to come in here one more time open your word, to worship you, to pray to you, God, to call on you, to meet our needs, uh, God, and to find a deeper relationship with you. We're not looking for religion here tonight. We're not looking for a list of do's and don'ts, but God, we want to find Jesus in the middle of all of it. God, we pray for this church, that we'd be a light to this community, and God, we pray for this service tonight, that it would be honoring to you, and as we open your scriptures, we come to it with a very open mind and open heart, not trying to impose our own opinions, God, but we just want to receive the truth from you. And we pray, God, if there's anybody here tonight that might be struggling with dissatisfaction in their life, even to the point, God, of a lost soul, someone who doesn't know you as their Savior, we pray that needs are met tonight. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Number one, we want to look at three areas here before I get into the main point of it, of how we wrongly define satisfaction, because I think we're really good at this, although maybe we wouldn't come out and say it. Uh, I think in our lives and the way we act and the way we behave, says a lot about how we wrongly define satisfaction. Uh, if you look here, Peter and John go up to the temple. They're doing as what they would always do. They're going to worship God. They're going to pray to God. And we find there's a man here who's in a routine in his life. He's lame. He's been that way, the Bible says, uh, from his mother's womb. In other words, he's not known anything else. His life has been one that you and I would look at as maybe a social outcast. Uh, somebody who'd kind of fallen on hard times, and literally he's stuck with this ailment, and you would almost feel sorry for the man, and it would be easy to do something, as Peter and John are going to do here in a minute, and, and offer a whole lot to him. Money, financial gain, clothes, whatever it may be, and you would be a nice person in doing that, but we're going to see that sometimes satisfaction doesn't always come from stuff or things. Um, first way I think that we understand that wrongly defining satisfaction is going to exhaust you. Notice what it says in verse 2. Whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple. 
I don't know about you, but sometimes I find a lot of people in my life who are just going through it day after day after day after day. They come to work. It's the same expression. Just, just another day. Here we go again. Can you enjoy my life? You know, going home. Here I go again. No, another argument. You know, got another, another issue with the kids again. You know, I get my paycheck. Still not enough. You know, got, got another payment to make. And it's just exhausting to see these people who are just chasing after satisfaction, and it seems like they can't ever find it. And here's a guy sitting there day after day just saying, let's just give me a little bit more. Maybe, maybe today will be the day. And then at the end of the day, it's always the same answer. It's never enough. It's never enough. Stuff's never enough. You know, people's handouts are never enough. You can get some love from people, but it's never enough. You know, I'm just exhausted after all these things. It's amazing at the time and energy and the resources we put into finding satisfaction in it. I'll give you some statistics that might blow your mind. This, this was mind warping to me. In 2014, the United States of America's GDP per capita, meaning per household, this is what we bring in here on average in the United States, $54,400. You say, well, that's nice. I mean, that's a decent little chunk, you know. I want to compare that to another country, Afghanistan. The average home there per year, per year, $1,900. $1,900. And if, if you're like me and you're looking around a lot, all you're seeing is just more doom and gloom. I don't ever have enough. It, my house isn't, the, and my vehicle, and woe is me, and I, you know, $54,400 per year for the average home. Folks, if you cut that in half, you'd still be a king in that country of Afghanistan. If you cut it in half. We spent last year on entertainment alone per person in the United States $2,728 a year just to entertain ourselves. On apparel and services, meaning the clothes and the shoes that we would buy, we spent $1,786 per person. That was up, by the way, 11%. So apparently the stuff we had the year before just wasn't good enough because we weren't satisfied with, you know, what we were wearing. So we had to go out and get more. The average American in 2015, this is amazing. Every day spend on average $90 on themselves. $90. I don't know how many times I see commercials, a dollar a day and you can feed, you know, a family or whatever. And, and we're spending $90 a day on ourselves? This is not a message against spending or money or anything like that. All I'm saying is, where are you defining satisfaction in your life and what is it that you're chasing after? Because here's a guy who's exhausted after chasing it, and he still doesn't got it. And it's amazing to me. We're spending, 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 and we got plenty of it. And yet at the end of the day, depression's at an all-time high. Just doom and gloom, people down and out all the time, just acting like we ain't got anything anymore. All in the search of, as Keith Richards would say, we can't find any satisfaction in life. I just, just can't find that meaning, that goal that I'm looking for. Look at what verse 3 says. Peter and John coming, he says, who's seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple? Asked in alms. Because, you know, that's what he always does. It's just Peter and John, just a couple other guys going to the temple. Surely, right, surely some, some Christian folk would be generous and give to me. The next thing, it's not only exhausting, it's just blinding. Like when you wrongly define satisfaction, you have no idea what you're chasing after. You just go through life in a whim, just looking for anything and everything, and just, you know, everything at my finger. If I can get a hold of it, that might satisfy me for the moment, and we're just blind to what we're looking for. I wrote down here, when you're focusing your attention on false satisfaction, you might as well be walking around in the dark. You have no idea what you're looking for. So in, in one season of your life, maybe, maybe more money will make me satisfied. And you find that out to be not true. And so the next season, maybe a relationship will satisfy me more than anything. I can find a new relationship and my life will be complete. Or maybe, maybe it's a promotion at work. Maybe if I just fulfill myself in my career, I can find satisfaction somewhere 
And all the while, we're just blind to reality. We have no idea where real satisfaction comes from because we're blinded by our own appetites. We, we, we literally think, you know, I can come up with it, and therefore that will be the thing that satisfies me the most, and I'll just pursue after it. And once I obtain it, but you know as well as I do, once you obtain it, what's the, the answer to that is, well, I want more of it. If you get that promotion, well, I want the next promotion. Well, I got a, I got a raise in pay. Well, I want another raise in pay. And on and on and on. Well, I got this brand new house. Well, I'd like a new car to go with that. Well, here's more, you know, addition to your home. Well, I want not have, you know, I'd like to have a lake house. Like a new boat to go with that. And it's just always something more. Like we're looking for extra, extra, extra all the time. This past year, in order to satisfy your appetite, I was watching this interview last night, and there's this competition going to go on tonight between the games. It's for your attention. There will be some commercials being shown. Right, wrong, or indifferent, I have no idea what they're going to show, but here's what the minimum payment for 30 seconds tonight will cost you $5 million for 30 seconds of my time. Apparently I'm worth something. I don't know. It's good to be wanted, right? $5 million to try to impress Jeremiah Reiner to buy, sell, trade, indulge, whatever. $5 million for your attention. And the majority of us will never partake in any of it, but we might give it a thought. And that's what they're looking for, just to fish it out there to you. This one's amazing. I went back a few years ago just to see, what, are we still doing this? Have we been doing this? In 2010, on clothing and shoes alone, the United clothing and shoes only, the United States spent $334 billion. That's billion with a B on clothing and shoes. Also, we can wear them for a season, hang them up, give them away, donate them down to somebody else, or, or, well, I don't like that, I'll just get rid of it. There's the sad one. In that same year, we spent billions and billions and billions of dollars on food and beverages. Nothing technically wrong with that. We've got to eat and drink. That's part of life. You know what the number one selected food and beverage item was that year? We spent $9.7 billion on beer. There's where our priority was. Going back to Mr. Richards, we just can't get any satisfaction. We just, we just can't find it. We're looking anywhere and everywhere, and mankind keeps coming up empty day after day, after day. What is this man doing in verse 3, Jeremiah? He's, he's just blindly trying to find satisfaction. Here comes a couple of other guys. Maybe they got some change. And I'll just try to find some out of them. Let's look at verse 4 and 5. Peter fastened his eyes upon him with John and said, look on us. I found that interesting that he had to get his attention. I don't know if the man was looking away from him. He was embarrassed. He felt like an outcast. Um, you know, social norms maybe back then. You just didn't want to look at somebody. You felt inferior. I don't know, but I found that odd that Peter and John, by the way, who were just a couple of nobodies, just a couple of fishermen, walking to the temple, minding their own business, and he has to get his attention. He says, look up here, buddy. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something. So his motive for looking at them wasn't because Peter and John wanted his attention. His motive was, oh, I got somebody again. I, I, got, I got my fix, what I was looking for. The next thing as to why I think we wrongly define satisfaction, most of the time we're just downright selfish about it. I mean, if, if you're like me, most of the times when you pursue something that's out of God's will, it's strictly based on what you want. And so you just crave something with your own appetite. So whatever it is that's out of God's will, you'll just pursue it. And when our definition of satisfaction is anything or anyone other than Jesus, we are pursuing a dead end. You may not see it now. You may not even feel it now. You may not even ponder it down the road, but that is a dead end. It's amazing how much he spent his time and energy on this and yet his situation never changed. 
He's still at the gate. He's still there every day. He's asking and he's asking and, and nothing changed. Listen, you could have changed his clothes. You could have changed his house. You could have changed his friends even. You could have given him a job. But folks, at the end of the day, he's still seeking satisfaction. It's amazing that his selfishness is the reason that kept him from it. And I think that's the number one reason you and I mostly don't find Jesus. It's because we're so selfishly looking for something else. I'll give you an interesting story I heard the other day. Way back in the early 1900s, after Henry Ford had established Ford Motor Company, done pretty well for himself, a rival company, Lincoln, who's still around today, by the way, made by Ford. That's kind of where this story goes, but... Uh, they were struggling financially pretty bad, uh, and it looked like they weren't going to make it. Ford decided to buy them out. He thought, well, I can use the factory. I can use the workers. That's just another place. We can put our logo on there, and voila, I've saved myself a lot of time and energy. As he walked in, he went into the office suites up on third or fourth floor there at the Lincoln Institute, and he looked around, was looking at his management, and he got to the maintenance part department. He says, guys, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to go out to the woods out there past the... Uh, building supplies area, and I want you to cut down a huge tree for me. I want you to trim the limbs off of it. I want you to bring it back up here to my office. And they said, oh, okay, sure, Mr. Ford, you know, whatever you want. Uh, you're writing the paychecks now, so we'll, we'll abide by that. And they go out and they cut down a huge tree and trim it up, just massive log. That's all it was. And they brought it upstairs. They said, here it is, Mr. Ford. What would you like us to do with it? I just want you to place it right in front of the elevator, just, just right in front of it. And no questions asked. They just set it there. And as people came in and off the elevator, they're stepping over it, kind of looking at it very strange. Three weeks went by. Not a person moved that log. Nobody asked of it. Nobody inquired about why it was even there. Nobody went to Mr. Ford's office and asked, you know, why is there a log in front of our elevator? Three weeks later, Mr. Ford walked into the office, called everybody into the meeting room there. He says, folks, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but I need everybody to turn in their stuff right now. Every single one on this floor is fired. People were outraged. They're like, what are you talking about, Mr. Ford? How could you do something like this? And he says, well, it's very simple. For three weeks, I set that thing right in front of that elevator. Not one of you ever decided to move that thing. Not one of you ever came to my office and asked me why it was there. Not one of you looked at somebody else and was questioning, why is there a log in front of an elevator? He says, but for three weeks, you selfishly walked right over that thing and did your own thing and never concerned yourself with the betterment of everybody around you. He says, the reason that this company's failing is you've got too many selfish people, so every single one of you all can leave now. We're looking for team players. He fired everybody on that floor that day. He turned the company over to his son, and folks still to this day were making Lincoln vehicles. Selfishness doesn't work. You may think it does, but it doesn't. That's a hard story about a man trying to get a point across to people. Selfishness does not work in life. It doesn't work in business, and it doesn't work in your spirit either. So what is real satisfaction? What does that really look like? Well, let's go on to read this. Verse 6, Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none. You say, well, how did he have anything? Because Jesus told him to give it all away. That's why. He's just doing what Jesus told him. You know, there's not one point in this story, by the way, if you go and read, will you ever find Peter dissatisfied with anything in his life? He said, I don't, I don't have any material possessions, but such as I have, I'm going to give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Real satisfaction, folks, has nothing to do with materialism. That is as hard a point for an American society as it gets. When we've all grown up with the same privileges, yes, some of us may make a little more than others, but in the long run, folks, we are far better off than the majority of people on the earth right now. We don't, we don't even comprehend how well we have it, I don't think. Because so much we're caught in our bubble of materialism that we often forget, what's the rest of the world look like? And we paint ourselves in this small little corner. Jesus said, for what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole earth? 
and then lose his own soul. What would it really profit you if we gave you everything? And when you die, you go to hell. What will the point of that have been? For a brief moment in your life, people looked up to you? For a small portion, you were wealthy? For a few seconds of your life, you could have anything you wanted. And, and you neglected Jesus, the one who died on a cross for you, the one who gave everything he had for you, the one who stepped out of perfect heaven into an imperfect world to buy your freedom, and you slapped him right in the face because you'd rather have stuff. That, that's, that's alarming that, sadly, a lot of people are doing that. And they're doing it over material possessions. You know, if we gave somebody the whole earth and didn't give them Jesus, that's got to be the greatest robbery in the history of mankind. It really would, it would have to be the greatest robbery that you and I could conceive of if we gave everybody something and withheld Jesus from them. So here's my question to that. Why is it, I want to throw out a big fancy term here, why is it that the social gospel is so popular then? Because I'm, I'm just going to just go ahead and, and lock, stock, and barrel on my generation. We love the social gospel. We love it. My generation, oh my goodness, it's the biggest thing. It's the selling point. It's what draws the crowds. It sounds a lot like this. Jesus came to make everybody's life a little bit better, so you should too. You know, because he healed everybody. He took away their medical bills. He gave them some food, so we should go out and feed them too. He made their homes a little bit nicer, so we should make their homes nicer too. He gave them stuff, so we should give them stuff too. What about the cross, Jeremiah? Well, I don't concern yourself with that. Jesus was all about stuff. Sound familiar? So let's, let's go out and feed everybody, but withhold Jesus from them. Let's go out and dig water wells all across the world so people can have fresh water, but don't give them the gospel, you know, because this temporary world is a whole lot more important than eternity. He said, Jeremiah, are you trying to tell me that we shouldn't go out and help people? I didn't say that. All I'm saying is you're really not helping anybody if you don't give them Jesus. Brandon, what, what good would it do, pal, if I gave you water for the rest of your life and you spend eternity in hell? Not a thing, would it? Scotty, if I gave you all the nicest clothes you could ever buy and you never went without, but you split hell wide open, then what have you really gained? Nothing. And we are in love with it. My, I don't know what it is, but we love this social gospel. Jesus came to make everybody's life better. But don't worry about surrendering your life to him. It's appalling, and it's sad, really, that a lot of people are buying into this. On a side note here, one of the main reasons that drew me to this mission trip we're going to this summer is as soon as I heard somebody say, you're going to get the opportunity to witness to a lot of people, I said, sign me up. And I don't, if we build a house, great. If we get some of my water, awesome. But as long as somebody hears about Jesus has never heard before, mission accomplished. Period. Period. Because somebody's eternity could literally be changed. And it wasn't because I drove on a plane somewhere, but it was because Jesus showed up and met somebody there. That's not the social gospel. That's the gospel. Amen? And if you neglect the real gospel and exchange it for the social gospel, all you've done is lie to a generation of people. And you will, by the way, I really believe it, you'll be held accountable for that. Verse 7, and he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And this is Jesus at work here. Immediately, immediately, his feet and ankle bones received strength. Immediately. Real satisfaction is life-altering. It, it really is. At, at nearly 14 years old, I was angry at people. I was upset that I wasn't right with God. I began to blame life on a lot of people. I was upset that I, that I had to do what I knew I had to do, which was give my life to Jesus. But I was mad at that because I wanted another way. I didn't want to confront my sin. I didn't want to have to confess that to people. 
I thought good old-fashioned Sunday school kid could just get by. That made me angry. I was unsatisfied. I was unsatisfied that I looked at a lot of other people and I said, I want what they're having, but I don't want to go through what they had to go through to get there. I don't want to repent. I, I don't want to confess my faults to people. I remember the night that I did get saved and I did confess that life-altering would be the term I would use. Literally life-altering. Like, my eternity changed, yes, but everything about me immediately, I can testify this guy, just became different. I looked at life different. I looked at people different. I viewed God different. I, I viewed His Word a whole lot different than a book of stories, but it really came to life finally, that this was the real thing. I viewed prayer differently than a bunch of words at an altar, but now we're interceding for people on behalf and we're talking to God who literally can change things. There was joy in my life that I never found before. There was a peace of mind that came over me that thought, you know what, no matter what happens to me, I'm good with God. I'm good with God. And that's all that mattered because it was life altering right there. And do you know what nobody did for me? Nobody removed my problems. But God did remove my sin. And what's happened to this guy right here is somebody's coming in, and yes, they might have fixed it, but there is a removal of sin in this process. That's the life-altering part. That's the life-altering part that we're looking at. You cannot hide Calvary in a corner and expect to see people's lives change. Man, oh man, and I bet we could go around the room, and you've probably been in services before where it was everything but Jesus. And we all walked out, and oh, we were feeling good. But did anybody's life really change? No. I've been a part of movements before, and you, you think it's a thing of God, but the reality of it is nobody's life was any different. Therefore, no, there was no God in that. When God moves, and God intercedes, and God brings satisfaction, it's life-altering. But the moment you begin to hide Calvary out of the picture, then you have no life-altering. Because that goes back to that social gospel. He didn't come to take away all of our problems. He came to take away our sin. That's the life-altering part of it. Verse 8 and 9, you want to know what happened. If, if you really got it, well, anybody that leaps and stands isn't lame. So yes, he leaping and stood and walked and entered with them into the temple. Walking. This is how he went into the temple. By the way, a quiet place. You want to talk about upsetting the establishment. Here's a guy who couldn't hold it in. He got up. He started shouting. He started praising. He just had a good old-fashioned individual revival, praising God. And all the people saw him walking. And Well, of course they did. Because <laughs> it's really hard to contain when somebody's really satisfied. But man, have I walked into a lot of services where it was as dead as a doornail, and I thought, is anybody satisfied? Is anybody satisfied? Is there anyone to just, just let loose and say, God, I love you so much. You have done so much for me. I just want to jump and shout and scream and praise God. And it's just hard to contain when God does something awesome. But yet, I don't know what it is, but we just want to paint the Holy Spirit in the corner over here and be like, you hang out until I feel like it's time for you to kind of come in. Because this is our organization, and we're going to do one, two, three, A, B, C, and if we have any time left over, we'll let you come in. And the reality of it is, if you really got satisfied in God, it's all about just, just let it go, man. Just let it go. Let God move. Let Him have His way in your life. You get out of the way and let God get in the way, and this will be a great time. I've walked into services before, and I'm not condoning this, because I, I believe the Word should be preached, and I believe there should be prayer, and I believe there should be worship. I really do. But I've been in places sometimes, we came in, somebody gave a testimony, and that was it, buddy. It just broke loose. Like, it was just break loose time. Somebody else testified, somebody else testified, somebody sing, somebody testified. And it was just like, man, God is moving in this place right now. And I've literally seen people get saved like that. All because people said, you know what, I'm not going to quench the Spirit tonight. I'm just going to let it go. And I'm going to brag on God. This isn't about me, but I'm going to brag on my God for doing something amazing in my life over and over and over again. And here's a guy who walked into a really quiet place where must be very religious and said, enough is enough, people. We've got to break loose. There's a real God in heaven who just changed my life forever thanks to a couple fishermen over here who had nothing to give me but Jesus. Amazing. 
I love what Psalm uh, 150, the last one says. I'm going to read it to you really quickly. Verse 1, praise ye the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him in the firmaments of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts, praise him according to his excellent greatness, praise him with the sound of the trumpet, praise him with the sound of the psaltery and harp, praise him with the timbrel and dance, praise him with the stringed instruments and organs, praise him upon the loud cymbals, praise him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord, praise ye the Lord. Now that's a good service. That's a good service. Like, let's just get in there and make it all about God right now and not contain anything. Let's just let it go. Give it all to Jesus. Amen? Matthew 5, verse 6, Blessed are they which hunger and thirst after righteousness. What's going to happen to them? They're going to be filled. In other words, they'll say like David did, My cup runneth over. In other words, I cannot contain the goodness of God in my life because he has been better to me than I'll ever be to him. And for that reason, I cannot contain it. I will let the world know that I love God. I love the Lord. I want to be about the Lord. He is my Savior. He is my rock. He is my everything. Amen? Verse 10 and 11, going back to Acts. Bible says this, and they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. In other words, nobody had to question who this guy was. Very amazing. This man they've known for all these years is actually walking and jumping and praising God. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's. Greatly wondering. Real satisfaction, folks, is contagious. It's, it, listen, when somebody gets the real thing, you'll know it. You'll know it. It, it. it doesn't take the CIA to figure out if somebody got saved or not. Okay? You will definitely know if they got the real thing because it's life-altering and they're probably going to tell a few people about it. One of the direct signs that I remember that I was right with God that night I got saved, I immediately grabbed the phone on the way home and called my dad. I remember that. He was at work that night. He was working shift work, and he wasn't able to be at the service. He was always there. He just happened to be working that night, and I remember not being ashamed to tell him, you know, Dad, I was wrong for a long time. I'm saved, though. Like, I, I got it right with God tonight. Then I called my grandparents. I called my aunts. I called my uncles. Mom didn't have to tell me to do that. I was just very glad to tell people Jesus made a difference. I'm not who I used to be anymore. I will not be perfect, but in the eyes of God, I'm right now. I want to work towards that. It's a contagious thing when you get the real thing. Amen? I love this story years ago. Wilma Rudolph, who had contracted um, polio virus when she was young, very young, was not able to walk or move. At one point in time, went to the doctor, and they literally told her, you'll probably never walk. Thanks to a man by the name of Jonas Salk, who invented a cure for polio, what I can only imagine is millions of people now who have been healed because of one man's dedication to finding um, the cure for a disease that had ruined so many lives. Wilma Rudolph got that vaccination and slowly but surely began to develop strength back in her legs to the point she was able to walk again. She was still young and vibrant, so her muscles grew really well. She started running and playing with other kids. People began to notice that Wilma's Wilma's pretty fast, and she began to enter herself into athletic competitions and races, and she actually started winning a few of them. Wilma Rudolph got so good, folks, good folks, that at one point in time set the world record for the fastest woman in the world race and won a gold medal for her country. When she was asked about that when she was younger with polio, she said this, My doctors told me I would never walk again. My mother told me I would, so I believe my mother. You know, sometimes you just have to catch that contagious feeling. When one person gets it, sometimes it just bleeds into other people. You know how I know that? 
because Peter and John were the only two guys trying to be contagious that day. And so we will not withhold Jesus from anybody. And thank God another man caught it. Amen? It's contagious when you get the real thing. Verse 12, And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, You men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? I love that. <laughs> like, what's the big deal? Just a lame man walking. Okay, do you know what's going through his mind? Well, if you think that was a big deal, you should see me walking on water one time. If you think that's a big deal, one time I walked into a house and he raised a dead girl to lie. If you think that's a big deal, one time we buried him and three days later he got up and wasn't there anymore. Why well, marvel you at Jesus doing miraculous things? As if that was something supernatural. That's who he is. He's a miracle working God. And he's still a miracle working God. Or why look ye so earnestly on us, as though by our own power or holiness we'd made this man walk? Is it, not only do you not believe Jesus, why, why would you look at me as if I did any of that? Real satisfaction is only of God. Only. I can testify to this. I've looked in a lot of places for help. I've looked in a lot of places for satisfaction. I've looked in a lot of places for fulfillment and meaning and purpose. And do you know what? I came up empty every time. I've tried to find in friends and people and, and athletics and, and awards and whatever. I, I, you know, I've looked at a lot of places for fulfillment, but I've never found them anywhere else other than God. There is this, there is this calming satisfaction that comes over you when you are right with the Creator. Psalm 16, 11, that will show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. And at thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Not in, a, not in a church or people that you know or some denomination or, or some new job or more money. You're going to find pleasure in God and God only. And until you stop the dead-end pursuits, folks, you'll never find that real satisfaction that this man found in Acts chapter 3. Do you know his life was eternally changed that day? Because for years and years and years, he tried to find satisfaction in everything other than God. And for one moment in his life, immediately there was satisfaction thanks to Jesus. My question is, are you? Are you satisfied in Jesus? Or are you like many of the people of our culture and this world, chasing after satisfaction in places that will only lead you to dead ends? I'll ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes in, in a very serious moment because I'm not going to assume anybody in here is okay with God. I'm not God. I'm not your judge. I don't know that. But what I will ask you is this. Why is it that you keep pursuing the things you're pursuing and come up with dead ends, yet you keep neglecting God? He is your only hope for satisfaction with your soul. If you are looking for eternity in heaven, it will go through Jesus, and Jesus only. So as everybody's heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I want to invite, if, if you feel in your spirit that, you know what, Jeremiah, I'm not right with God. I've chased a lot of things in life, pal. And you're right, none of those things have ever fulfilled. As a matter of fact, I only feel more empty now than I ever have. If that's you, I would invite you to Jesus. I can, I, I can offer you some things, but I'm, I'm going to offer you the only thing that really matters to you. I'm going to offer you Jesus. If that's you, would you raise your hand and say, Jeremiah, I would like you to pray for me. I, I need Jesus Christ in my life. Things are not right, and my soul's not satisfied in God. Anybody tonight? Thank you. Somebody else? So I would honestly say, Jeremiah, things are not right spiritually, and it's alarming to me. I'm not going to drag anybody up here because I don't save people, and there's not a person in this room that's going to do that either. But I would ask you this. If, if you're willing to raise that hand, would you be willing to walk forward and say, you know what, I'm, I'm willing to pray about it too. I need to receive Jesus. 
I need to confess my sins. I need satisfaction in my soul. Would you be willing to do that? I know there's a crowd of people here, but listen, Jesus died in front of a lot of people naked for you. He suffered the ultimate shame so that you could have a soul that was satisfied. Would you be willing to step out of the pew and walk this way and pray to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior? Christian, I would ask you this. Are you satisfied? Are you really satisfied or have you been chasing after dead ends? Have you been substituting Jesus? If that's the case... Listen, there's no shame in it, but I would ask you, you might want to check yourself. You might want to check yourself, repent, and remind God, there's no substitute for you, Lord, in my life, and I'm sorry. And, and in those silly pursuits that you know are only dead ends, in those things, if that's you tonight, we have a full altar. It's wide open right here. If you'd like to pray about that, we'd love to pray with you. Listen, we're in the business of getting people right with God. That's what we're here to do. We want to see your soul satisfied. We want to see you right with your Creator. If not, I'd ask you to pray with me here. I'll turn the service back over to TJ. Father, thank you so much. Thank you so much for doing the miraculous. God, for taking a, a, just a pathetic old sinner like me and giving him satisfaction in his soul that he never deserved. And God, for the countless people like this lame man who have been in pursuit of things over and over and over in their life, and yet they have found you to be the one that satisfies. God, we thank you for your word, for your spirit tonight. It's been good. It's been pleasing. But Lord, we, we can't get those people off our, our, our hearts right now, God, who, who might have raised their hand, even wanted to raise their hand, and admit that. Things aren't right in their spirit. God, we plead for them right now that they would find you before it's too late. That they would seek out somebody. God, that they would call on you. They would pray to you to receive salvation. Because, Lord, we know that at the end of it all, that's the only thing that matters, is that we are right with you. And God, thank you for reminding us that when we pursue you, we will find full satisfaction. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you're going to do in our lives, God. And we just claim it right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Page 46 in the folder. If I had hope on me, 
in this world below I'd be covered with trouble There'd be no place to go But when I met Jesus And I started believing I got filled with His love Got cleansed by His blood I've just started living I've just started living. I've found me a brand new life. It's changed my direction. It's washed away all my strife. I'm a newborn believer. It's a holy and feeling. My Lord's getting lighter. My day's getting brighter. I've just started living. Don't look at me funny. You'll crop it up, dude. I'm the one bit discouraged. And I'm feeling no clue. Cause I've got the spirit. And it's totally thrilling. I've given up on counting, got no time for doubting. I've just started living. I've just started living. I've found me a brand new life. It's changed my direction. It's washed away all my strife. I'm a newborn believer. It's a holy and feeling. My Lord's getting lighter. My day's getting brighter. I've just started living. Let's be dismissed to prayer. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the word that you sent through Brother Jeremiah this evening to us, Father God. We thank you that you are the ultimate satisfaction, Father. Father God, and you're a lasting satisfaction. Lord, and truly in your word, when you say to taste and see that you are good, Father. God, you're good every day. Father, you renew you renew in us your spirit each and every day, Father God. And we just thank you for that. Lord, and we just pray that we'll always continue to, to draw close to you, Lord, just to sit at your table. Lord, knowing that we'll always be satisfied there. There's nothing else in this world that can satisfy like our Savior can. And we thank you for that. We thank you for your word. Lord, we just pray to you as, go, as we go into our fellowship time now. Lord, that you would just bless it, just bless the food, those that prepared it. Lord, just help us to grow closer in our relationship with one another during this time as we celebrate you and what you've done for us. For it's your name we pray and we ask all these things. Amen.